Thank you. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm so excited about uh, this week, Street Week in LA. Uh, this is our seventh annual um, event. Uh, this is the first time that we've been online. Last year, amazingly, in 2020, February of 2020, I think Street Week might have been our last event, um, uh, or one of the last ones anyway. And so this is our first Zoom. Um, uh, I'd love it if all of you guys were here with me right now. Uh, but uh, since you aren't, um, uh, we are, I should say, because of Zoom and because of the pandemic, we are able to invite all these wonderful people from around the world. Uh, Eleanor Simone is our first guest, and I'm um, about to introduce her. Um, again, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. I, I, I'm looking around to see who's here. Um, uh, I, I'd love to like chat with you, but we got to get moving because she's got a really great slideshow to show us. Um, let me just give you a little bit of information about uh, Eleanor, and then she will tell you a lot more. Um, this is my second time to meet her. She uh, uh, very graciously came to my webinar, um, and that was where we first met, uh, though I've uh, seen her work for uh, uh, quite some time now, and uh, I'm just so excited to have her here. She um, grew up, she's actually American, she was born in America, but her parents are French, so she's American French, and she, she grew up in France. Um, and then uh, about college age, after, after a few years at college there, she came over to the University of Pennsylvania to uh, finish her uh, master's degree. Um, and then she went to New York um, and as a photographer and worked as a studio manager and she walked the streets of New York for years <laughs> taking pictures. Um, and then she just decided, I'm moving to Chile. So I, I'm so excited. I, I'm a, I, it's Val. I said, could you please tell me how to say it? It's Val Perizzo, but she'll, she'll say it better. Um, so uh, anyway, I'm just delighted to have you, uh, Eleanor. Thank you so much for being here and um, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna try to screen share. All right. Um, um, yeah, so Julie, as you mentioned, I got to listen to your uh, introduction to street photography a couple of weeks ago. And um, I found the LACP community so friendly and everyone was so, so engaged with photography. So ever since then, I was really looking forward to this talk and, and to get a chance to, to show my work. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, this is my website and social media if you wanna stay in touch. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about myself. And as I do, I'm gonna show you some images uh, that I've taken in different corners of the world, but I'm not gonna stop on any of them because I want I have a lot I wanna get through today. And um, and I wanna focus on the body of work that I'm making now in Valparaiso and also what I've been working on since you know the world as we know it came to an end <laughs> and uh, what I've been doing in pandemic since I wasn't able to do street photography. So I am originally French, as you've mentioned. But um, so my parents are French and I had a rather nomadic childhood um, because they're quite adventurous. And so we grew up in different parts of the world when I was really little. Um, we lived in Mexico, Switzerland, in the US, which is where I was born and why I ended up speaking like this instead of with you know, a very lovely French accent, but I, I don't have it, so. Um, so we grew up in different parts of the world. My, my parents at that time, they moved around uh, pretty much seasonally. Um, and after a few years, they moved uh, back to France. That was, that was a weird way to say it. My parents had moved back to France on their own. We moved back to France all together as a family. <laughs> they didn't abandon us. Um, this is where the story takes a sad turn. No, so after a few years, we moved back to France, but even there, we continued to move every four or five years. So from that upbringing, I get my taste of travel, which I very much still have. Um, and in a normal non-COVID year, I, I travel a lot. I'm on planes a lot. And it also has to do with my ability to kind of pick up my bags and move elsewhere and not give it much of a second thought. So that's uh, thanks to my parents. And I'd like to remind them of that. Anytime they tell me, oh, you live too far and come visit. It's like, this is your, <laughs> this is your doing. So, um, and I think it also, that a brain has something to do with my becoming a photographer in a way. 
because I think it's made me more observant, you know, having to get used to a new environment and figure it out and figure out with people. Um, and my, my sister, she has a really nice way to talk about our upbringing. She says um, that it left her with the impression of having always freshly landed in her own life. And I just love that idea, having freshly landed in your own life. So I'm gonna steal that from her today. And, um, you know, moving around so much means that I don't really know where home is. Um, I, I'm French, but not totally French. I haven't, I left France 11 years ago. And um, it means that for me, everywhere I am feels a little familiar and a little foreign at the same time. And I think it's always gonna be the way it is. And I think that shows in my photography. Um, so I grew up in France, mostly childhood, teenage years, and most of university. And then, as you mentioned, for the last year of my master's degree, I, I went to the US. I did an exchange program. And during that year, I got to take a darkroom class. I think my school wasn't used to doing exchange programs in the US. So they told me I could do whatever classes I wanted as long as I wrote a master's thesis. And so I did, I did just that. I took anything, almost nothing that related to what I was actually studying, which was 18th century painting. And so I took a darkroom class, which I was allowed to do. And I loved it. I, I love the process. I love being in a darkroom all day. And um, I had gotten a taste for photography in high school. I went to an, art, an arts high school because I already was interested in the arts. And there I had a little digital camera in my class and I made a pinhole camera with a friend. And that's, I think that's when I first felt like I had an affinity with, with a medium. But that darkroom class in, in Philadelphia, that kind of struck a chord. And of course I was shooting for the class because I needed things to develop. Um, and I was shooting street photography. I wasn't quite, I wasn't trying to do street photography. I didn't really have an awareness of a history of a genre. I didn't really know it was a genre. I just liked walking around with a camera. And Philadelphia is a great, great place for street photography. Um, so I graduate and after that I moved to New York. And because I'd taken that class and because I really liked photography, um, and the darkroom because of it. I, I tried to find a place where I could continue darkroom and that's how I got involved at the International Center of Photography. So I took a first class and then a second class and then a third class. Um, and over the years, I became more involved with the school. Um, and I even got to, to TA, um, first in the darkroom and then in different classes. And I love I loved the experience and the community also, um, not just at ICP, but yeah, I mean, New York has a great street photography community, right? Um, and so I continued doing street photography for the time I, I, lived, uh, I lived in New York. So that was, I moved to New York in 2010. So by 2016, I was starting to get a little antsy because it's been six years and I've never lived anywhere that long. Six years to this day, I saw my record. So I had this little voice being like, what are you doing? It's time to move, it's time to move, pick up your bags, go. Um, and so I wanted to go and I didn't really know where to go. I just needed to change. And uh, my sister who I'm really close with, she moved in, in 2016 from France to Chile. Um, her husband is Chilean. And so they moved with their uh, two, month, two month old uh, son. And she was having a, a hard time at first. And so she kind of needed her sister and I really needed a break and I just wanted a change of pace. So I quit my job. Or actually, I should say my jobs. I had a few. Um, I think generally I had two to four jobs in New York, not just because New York is a hustle, but I'm also a little bit of a workaholic. So I quit my jobs and I put all my stuff in storage and I buy a one-way ticket to Chile. Um, I spotted a few friends in the audience who have invited me to come over. <laughs> so be aware, if you invite me to come over, I might show up with, uh, with a backpack and, uh, and be ready for a new, for a new adventure. Um, so I show up and well, my plan wasn't to stay in Chile. Here's, here's what my plan was. 
I was done with New York that I, I felt pretty strongly about. So I put all my stuff in storage. I thought I would go to Chile for a little bit, um, help out my sisters, spend some time with them, and then I would go elsewhere. And that, that never happened. Um, partially because I'm very close to my sister and I became even closer to the Chilean side of my family and um, quite involved in, in raising my nephew. Um, so there, there's that, they're definitely an anchor for me here. And the other part is the city itself is Valparaiso. Um, my family is, is no longer in Valparaiso, they're in Santiago now, but I just loved the city. Um, and it's, I'd, there's something that just keeps me coming back here and is the only place in the world to this day that gives me butterflies. If I go away for a little while and when I come back, as soon as I see the city out of a window, which is gonna be on my left side, I get so excited and I start smiling like a maniac in a bus, you know, people move away. Um, and so, yeah, there's something in Valparaiso that I love. And so I wanted to stay and continue kind of exploring it. And I just, I also, I really liked the photography that I was starting to make here and the photographer that I was starting to become here. And so I felt like there was something in that encounter with a city that I wanted to kind of see through. Right here. Uh, this is a view of the Pacific from my window. Hmm. Okay. All right. Now we're good. Um, so I'd like to start with this, to open with this image of Valparaiso because I think it's a perfect representat representation of the city. Um, I don't know how many of you know it. Maybe some of you know the Sergio Lorraine book, but Valparaiso is really a maze of like uh, really narrow streets and all these little staircases and hidden alleys. And you can really get lost in the city. And I feel like you can get lost in this image in the same way that you can get lost in the city. And I also like to open with something that's really disorienting. I think it's kind of it's kind of fun. <laughs> it keeps you on your toes. Um, and here you can start seeing that I'm really interested in working with uh, light and shadow, right? Um, this scene without shadow, there's nothing there. The shadow is what makes it look like a labyrinth. Um, I should also add something because I've mentioned that I started photography in the darkroom working in um, with a black and white film photography. This is all digital. Um, I switched from film to digital quite a few years back. Um, I, I love the look and the feel of film and the experience in the darkroom. But at some point, I realized that all that time I was spending in the darkroom, I could be out shooting in the street. And so I, I made a switch. This one is one of my very, very first photos in, in Valparaiso. Um, there's a few things you can do when you do street photography. Um, sometimes you, you stumble on a moment and you're quick, you're sharp, you get it. If you're lucky, you frame it right and it's well composed. And another approach is to find a setting or even a, a backdrop that has potential and then you wait for something to happen, which is what happened here. So I see these uh, columns and the shadows and I think they look great. And they're just a frame waiting for something to happen. And I waited about uh, half an hour and then these two men uh, walked into the, to the photo. And I clicked the shutter and I knew I had something and I got really excited. Um, and I do that quite a lot when I shoot um, in the street, this idea of finding something and then waiting for something to happen, uh, finding like a backdrop essentially. But um, as I was putting this presentation together and looking at, the, at my, my slides, I realized that even if I do that a lot or, or maybe I feel like I do that a lot because I have to wait for the photo, they don't end up in my portfolio in, in the end very much. And so that got me really curious and I went digging in my archives and I, I started to wonder why, um, why I'm not so successful in the end. Um, and the conclusion I came to is that I think if you find something and you wait long enough, you will get somebody in the right spot in your composition or multiple people, that's just a waiting game. 
but oftentimes that's what a picture looks like in the end, right? It just looks like a passerby in the right spot. And in that you lose a little bit of the magic of street photography, which is like all these elements seem to kind of come together and they work together magically and you can't reproduce the image ever. Um, and so the idea I had for this image originally because there's two negative spaces in the middle and three positive spaces. I was like, great, I will get something different happening everywhere and it'll look great. And that never happened. But I think what I got instead is, is better in the end because um, they seem to fit. They seem to fit visually because of the ladder and the shadow of the ladder, that's a nice little triangle. And that works with the triangles of, uh, of the columns. And also because they work there. They're not just passers-by, they're actually in the life of the building. And so eventually that's why I felt like this one um, worked better than my failed attempts. Uh, this one I took at a cemetery, which is one of my favorite places to shoot. Um, in Valparaiso, I don't really like shooting in cemeteries in general. I, I just find it, it's a little weird, but this one I love. I love that place um, and just even to walk around, not just to photograph. But here I took that picture initially with nobody in it. Um, I, I like the scene in and of itself. I liked the different layers and uh, that open tomb in the middle. I thought that was interesting. So I take a few pictures and I leave because I have no hopes of getting someone in my frame partially because it's, it's a cemetery, it's not terribly crowded, so I, I walk away. And as I walk away, I spot this boy who's playing with his dad and kind of running around or playing hide and seek. And so I, I run back to my, to my spot very, very casually. I run back and I, I, I'm in position and I wait for him. And I hear him walk in my frame and I take the picture. I, I did a little cemetery compilation for you. Um, so this is all in the same area. This is just one of these repeat places for me. Um, this this image I initially didn't like so much, and then about a year after I moved to Valparaiso, I went to New York, and I I still had uh, access to the ICP lab, so I was printing and uh, trying to make portfolios. And, um, and my friend, Paul Kessel, who maybe is here today, um, he was looking over my shoulder and he saw the photo and he's like, oh, we should print that, it's good. And uh, I wasn't so convinced, but I printed it. And when I printed it, the relationship with the image changed. Then I really started to like it. And I want to show you a little bit of the process of taking that photo. Um, so here you can see me physically just move from one side of him to the other is what I did. Um, and partially it's because there's in the first, in the first one, the top left one, there's a lot of white space. And so essentially I'm trying to get rid of that uh, to have a more balanced photo. So I moved to the other side of him and then I crouch down and I get, I get a little bit closer. But in doing that, of course he notices me <laughs> hovering around him. And so he hands me this postcard and it's that gesture of that exchange with him that ended up making a, a photograph. And the reason why I like it now, um, and especially as I see the other ones, the, is that the scene is very, um, I mean, it's, it's postcardy. It's, it's literally a postcard. And so in general, I don't really like that, uh, the kind of exoticism of a place. But from that, it got into, it got to a photo that is a little more abstract. Um, if you were to see this one without the other ones, it's, it's not that clear what is going on, what is painted, what is real. Um, and that, that is really interesting to me, that kind of halfway between uh, representation and, and, and uh, abstraction. And um, my colleague, Julia Beyer, she, she works there too at that uh, junction. So she's speaking tomorrow, 9 a.m. Don't miss it. So a lot of my uh, street photography in Valparaiso is very quiet. And this image is very lively. And there's a lot of movement and that's why I like it. Um, 
you know, there's a, this pack of stray dogs running after uh, the gas delivery guy. There's this um, older woman who's walking to her home. Even to the little detail of the trash bags on the fence um, in, the, in the background, it feels lived, you know, it's, it's very uh, neighborhoody in a way. And uh, the sense of movement is also reinforced by the shadows of the dogs. They look like little arrows pointing you to where you should be looking. And this image I took um, in a neighborhood where I was explicitly told that I can't go to on my own with a camera. And that would happen to me a lot when I moved to Valparaiso, that people kept telling me it's dangerous, you can't, the street photography is gonna be difficult, you can't really walk around on your own, especially not with a camera. And so I didn't really know what to do. I didn't know how much of it was true, how much of it was just people being protective. Um, and it's not, the city isn't like, isn't super dangerous. It's not like I'm gonna get shot in the street. I might get robbed, but you can get robbed anywhere. But I didn't know where I could go. And also I didn't speak a word of Spanish when I moved to Chile. So that didn't help me get around very much. And what happened is out of the, 42 hills in Valparaiso, I was told I could go to two, which are the touristic ones. And we're beautiful and there's plenty to do there. But I was like, what's happening in the 40 others? Like, what do they look like? That's, I want to know that. And I ended up getting a fixer, which I think is quite unusual for street photography. But I just, I just wanted to see what else was out there. Um, and so he's, uh, he was a friend of a friend of a friend. And he's this uh, tall, tattooed porteño who would walk me around in different neighborhoods. Uh, so for like a for a few weeks, he we'd pick a different neighborhood and we we would go through it. And so for this one, he's actually standing uh, next to me. And now I can you know I I walk around on my own. I know where to go, uh, where not to go, and I've never had any trouble. So. Um, so when I was. This is something that I noticed maybe like a year ago, but so I took a picture and the way they're sorted in my Lightroom catalog is never chronological. I, you know, I download, I star, and then I move things around um, in a Valparaiso folder so it looks good together. And so I've been working in Valparaiso for about um, four years. So let's say I, I worked for four years, I have a portfolio of 20. Um, the way I think about it is that, oh, that means I get one good photo once in a while. And in looking at my catalog not that long ago and sorting them chronologically, I actually realized there's little clusters. And so these photos are taking, you know, the same day, like within the half hour and also in different neighborhoods. Same here, different neighborhoods. And so uh, I thought that was really interesting because it's uh, kind of counterintuitive to the way I think I, I work where I thought I, you get the one once in a while and all the rest is garbage, but sometimes you have really good days. Um, so I don't know, maybe you're just uh, really in the flow, you're seeing more things, you're sharper, or the gods of street photography feel like throwing you a little bone because you've worked so hard and you've gotten nothing for weeks. This is all different because it is the same place, but it's still a pretty good ratio. I was pretty happy about that. Uh, this is at a circus, cute little dogs behind a curtain. And I was I was there with a friend who's working on a on a long term project on circuses, and so he took me to shoot. And I just I just think it's kind of funny that there are a lot of interesting characters, and what I do is I go around the the tent and I take pictures of dogs. This is what I always do. If there's something happening here, I will look the exact opposite direction. Um, so this image is not street photography. It's a candid moment, it's not posed, but it's a photo of my sister holding my nephew. And that's one of my favorite I ever took. And for a long time, I didn't include it in this body of work because every other picture is street photography and this one isn't. And so I thought I should be staying within, within the genre. And over time, I really felt like I needed to include it um, because without these two, there's no Valparaiso for me. I would never have come here and, and stayed here probably. 
Um, so now I, I include it and as I try to start to think about it as in a book form, I can't really imagine it without them. Um, this one, this one I took in Viña del Mar, which is the city right next to Valparaiso, and it's where I first lived when I moved here. Um, and this one I, I often refer to as a picture of nothing because it's taken in a really boring place. It's um, the wall is the wall of a mall that sits right just across from the bus terminal. So there's nothing very no interesting characters. And even that, I don't know why, but I became obsessed with that place. And probably because I passed by quite often. And I felt there was a photo there for no reason because there really wasn't interesting. But I was like, there is a photo there. And so I kept going back and I'm going to show you some uh, failed attempts. These are all on different days. I just, I've gone there for weeks slash months. And um, so these I pulled as I was thinking about this idea of the passerby. And I think why the bottom ones don't work is because that's what a photo en ends up looking like. Um, and especially when you see them all together. But here there's something a little, and I think the difference can be slim, but there's something a little more magical here in the way that he's just uh, like, let, let's see his feet are right, start and end right at the edge of the column. And there's a lot of little details like that, like the, um, his jacket starts right at the edge of, the, um, of that line. And so he feels like he belongs there and I can't really get that image again. And this photograph to me is interesting because I love photography in the way that you can record moment and a moment and save it forever, you know, like the decisive moment or just like an interesting thing you've noticed on the street. But there's also photographs like that, which are really pulled out of thin air. There's nothing there. There's not, there's not really a subject, but there's still a photograph. And that kind of transformative power of photography is something that really fascinates me, um, how you can just create images out of nothing. Is that a fish market, which is also one of my regular shooting spots when it's open. <laughs> this, well, I'm under strict lockdown right now, so I can't go. And it's right here. Um, If you go to my Lightroom catalog and you click on the keyword Pelican, you're gonna turn out 500 photos. So I have a little bit of a Pelican obsession. <laughs> I don't know why, but I've just started photographing them a lot, partially because there's a lot of them at the fish market and I shoot there a lot. And they're also kind of uh, emblematic characters of Valparaiso. I don't know if you can picture the Anders Peterson book on Valparaiso, but the cover is Pelicans. And so I started just photographing them a lot. And I thought I'd make a little compilation. Again, more pelicans. One of my rare verticals and my um, accidental homage to Sergio Lorraine. But so this staircase I saw on one of my very first walks in Valparaiso. And then I couldn't figure out where it was because as I've mentioned, you can get lost in the city. And I didn't really know. I just didn't know where it was. I knew that I thought it was a photo there and I, and I didn't get it. And then I couldn't find the circus again. And about two years ago, I moved um, to an apartment just a minute away from it. And so then I got to go to come back a lot more. But it's during the pandemic because I couldn't quite, I couldn't go to my regular spot. So it was just in my neighborhoods and that's how I ended up getting a photo there. And I call it my accidental um, homage to Sergio Lorraine pictures it is on the right. Um, I didn't have a photo of Sergio Lorraine in mind when I took it, but when I looked at it, I was like, okay, it's a vertical of a staircase in Valparaiso. There has, there has to be a Lorraine that looks like it. And so I opened the Valparaiso book and I flipped through pages um, and there was one. And the little arm gesture of a coincidence is, is just really nice. Is a nice peaceful moment. It's also one of the rare photos that has uh, one of a sea into an, an open horizon. I like things are a little claustrophobic, I guess. Um, this is another one at the fish market. And 
is also one of my rare photos from 2020, street photographs. So it's February before, you know, the pandemic. And um, when I go to the fish market, I try to go early because that's when it's busiest. So I get more things there. But on that day, I can't remember why, but I just had a hard time getting out of the house to the point where I almost didn't go shoot um, at the fish market because it was 11 and I figured I wouldn't find anything. But I went anyway, and I was really glad I did because the fish market was a lot quieter than usual, but it gave me nice moments. Um, for some kids, some fishermen's kids playing around and, and this, this man who was just washing off after, after a day of work. Um, this is also from February or March, maybe, of 2020. Um, and so what happened here is I was shooting in my neighborhood or close by, and I started shooting at a church. And the priest comes out and he's like, oh, you like photography. There's, I have a great view of El Pariso. If you'll, if you'll just follow me. Um, so I'm like, sure, I'll follow anyone anywhere for a picture, no problem. And so we go for the church and for a little back door and he takes me to like what is essentially his living quarters. And the view of El Pariso is great, but I've never, I never cared for the view. I was just really curious to see where he lived. <laughs> so, um, and so I arrive and there's this big cross that I hadn't noticed from down below in the street um, and his clothes drying. And so he leaves me to take photos of the view and I end up taking photos of his underwear drying for half an hour, which I'm sure is not what he intended for me to do, but he also said I could take pictures of anything, so. Um, again, something that seems to show up a lot in my photos. Um, I think this is really helpful if you're, when you're doing street photography to figure out like little collections of elements you're, you're drawn to in your photograph. Um, not to make a series, I don't think of this as a series at all. But sometimes when you're stuck in the street, knowing that you have these little things that you photograph regularly, it can help you, you know, get get going and get a little energized. So that's how I feel about the line of clothes. Um, and that was definitely the case during the, the early stages of a pandemic when I could only photograph really close to home. I started collecting these little elements as a way to, you know, to, to keep moving and keep photographing when I wasn't uh, really inspired. Um, so this little dog I photographed, it was kind of the end of my shooting day. I mean, you can, you can tell it's the, end, it's the end of the day because the shadows are really long. Um, but I'm sitting on a bench, I'm kind of done. And then he, he just comes by, comes by and he's really adorable and playing with a rock or something. Um, and so the first few you can see that I'm sitting on a bench and then the third one, I, I get up and I get closer and I get higher above. And that allows me to get that a third circle, which I really needed for this photograph to get the full the full shadow. All right. I had a lot of fun with Keynote this week. I discovered all the transitions and I put them all in one presentation. Um, so I'm gonna depart quite a lot from street photography, but I wanted to show you, I haven't done street photography in about a year now. Um, so I wanted to show you what I've been working on in the meanwhile. Um, if you're wondering why your screen turned from black and white to blue, quick note, these are all cyan cyanotype prints. Um, and I'll get to the process later. I'll actually, I'm actually gonna show you how, how a print is made. But for now, I wanna show the images first. So just know it's an alternative process. Um, it's also referred to as a blueprint or a sun print. So it comes out um, that shade of blue, which is a Prussian blue. Um, 
Um, so this body of work I started in my second lockdown. So I was in Chile and then I, I went to France for a few months after they um, reopened the borders and now I'm back in Chile. Um, as I said, it's kind of depressing, but my year is marked by lockdown one, lockdown two, lockdown, lockdown three. That's my sense of time now. So this is lockdown number two um, and I'm in France. And um, the series starts from kind of two elements. One is the cyanotype printing itself, a technique. I, I learned to make cyanotype prints just before the confinement. And what motivated me to learn it is that I wanted to find a process that was slower uh, than digital. And, you know, the cyanotype prints, when you coat the paper and you, it has a very zen quality, which is something that I'd miss from a darkroom. And so I learned that process and I, I loved it. And so I became a little bit obsessed with it. I started making piles and piles and piles of prints. Um, and also I really had a need to, yeah, just to make prints, to hold, to smell, to touch prints again. And I think that very much has to do with that weird year we've all had. So there's the cyanotype on one hand and then the other kind of inspiration for it would be light, right? Uh, I think it's pretty evident from my street photography that it's an element I just keep uh, getting drawn to over and over again. And so it's it's kind of the same here. Um, the, the title, Two Hours of Sunlight, that comes from a very simple observation that in the winter time, I only had two hours of direct light in my apartment. And that, you know, that time frame, that window, that became like the, the event for my day because I was shooting at home, I was doing self-portraits and um, other sorts of, of images at home. But that was an exciting time. I would, I would get really excited for it. I would shoot for the whole, for a full two hours. And then when they were done, I would write ideas for the next day so I could maximize that time. And you know, I'm confined, so I don't have much going on. So this is better than Netflix. It's, like, it's my two hours, I'm gonna use them. Um, and little by little, my days became just really consumed with cyanotype making. So I would wake up and then the first thing I would do in the morning would be to um, prepare papers for the next day. So I would wake up, I would coat my papers, set them to dry in the dark, pull out the papers that I made the day before, make some prints. Then the two hours of shooting came about. And when that was done, I would look at all the files of the pictures I'd taken and make negatives for the next day and so on and so forth. So my days were really exciting and going by super quickly, but in contrast, my nights were really long. Um, first of all, cause it's winter, so nights are long, <laughs> but also at night I, I started getting really anxious and I started getting panic attacks. And that became so systematic that I started dreading the sunset because I knew I would become anxious soon after. Um, and so I wanted that series to have kind of these two points, right? The, the day and the night, um, the light and the shadow, the dream and the nightmare. And to a degree too, the, the inside and the outside, which I think you can, you can tell in that, in that image. Um, and, I, and I love that technique for it because in cyanotypes themselves and the technique there's already for me this idea of day and light because the prints were, um, you need to expose them to sunlight for them to come alive. And that blue for me really evokes the night. So I love that there was sort of a nice um, harmony here between the technique and what I wanted to do with it, um, kind of regardless of the images I was making. I'm gonna show you how they're, how they're made. Um, so this is me coating paper. Um, I like to tape my edges because I like a clean edge, but oftentimes in cyan types, you can see brush strokes. So I'm working with a foam brush and I'm putting a photosensitive solution onto paper, which is a, a pretty thick paper. It's like a, a watercolor paper. And then I set it to dry in the dark overnight. Um, in the video, the room looks really bright, but actually my shades are way down. I just I kind of adjusted for it because you know, the prints are exposed um, in the sun. So you don't want to work with too much light because you don't want to spoil your chemicals and your papers. Uh, it's a contact printing process. So you make 
negatives add the size of the image you want. And so for the negatives, I work from digital files and I printed them onto a transparent paper. And that too, the learning of how, um, how to make the negative look the way I wanted for the process, that was also quite a learning curve. So I think this image I have of uh, four different negatives before I got to the one that looked how I wanted. Uh, the prints are then set into um, a printing frame. So it's, it's a watercolor paper and you soak it with um, that solution. So it, it comes out wavy. So what you have with that printing frame is you flatten the paper um, and you make it, uh, yeah, you flatten the, the paper with a negative. And that is something that you expose to sunlight. Um, so just in, out in the sun on your balcony, or if you can find one, a UV lamp will, will do. And it comes out looking like that, which is awesome. I love that color, but unfortunately there's no way to, to keep it, but that stage is really, really cool. Um, but if, if you were to keep it that way, it would just continue to, the, the paper would continue to expose and it would turn out all brown. And then you put, you develop it in a bath of water. You can add different things to the water. It can be um, the best for contrast. And if not, just water will be fine. And I love, I just love watching it change color. I really felt like a little alchemist in my, my home lab. And after the print is dried and flattened, it looks like that. So the color is, um, the print darkens as it dries and also for like a day after, it'll continue to darken a little bit. And, and I, I tried really hard to get a really deep blue. That's what I, that's what I wanted. Um, yeah, so I wanted to bring back the images that I've shown earlier. Um, so a quick note about the edit. So first of all, this is a project I'm still working on. It, it started in confinement, but I don't think of it as a pandemic series um, necessarily because I, I like that more intimate exploration and it's something that I wanna keep doing. Um, and in that body of work, I feel like there's something that's loosening up a little bit and that's really exciting to me. So I'm gonna keep working on it. And I'm at the moment I'm shooting for it. I just don't have a lab so I can't make prints. But I have negatives almost ready. Um, and about the edit, so the way I edit, not just this body of work, but street photography and just photography in general, is very intuitive. It's very visual. Um, I don't. I never really want to make a clear narrative with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you know something that's really linear. And here it's a little bit of the same. I I want. I think my work is very interpretive. Um, and I also want there to be a lot of room for the, for the viewer to kind of insert themselves in the work. That being said, for this one, I had really early on the idea that I wanted to start with an opening and to end with nighttime. And then the rest is kind of moving, moving pieces. Um, and lastly, for, I mean, for the sake of a Zoom presentation, this, these are all scans of prints but they look quite different in person, right? And in the way that I'm starting to think about, you know, the physical form for the work in exhibition or in book form, I want that material aspect of the work. It was really important in my making the work. That's why I did cyanotypes because I wanted that physicality. Um, and so it's gonna be really important too um, in how I show it. And I think the form lends itself quite nicely to a small artist book, you know. Um, and I work with small, small prints in general too. I've gone up to four, 30 by 40 prints, but generally they're A5, so they're quite small. Um, and so that's something I'm, I'm also thinking about now. But just be know that the end result is gonna look quite different from, from this. Beautiful work, Eleanor. Really beautiful. Thank you for sharing those with us. Thank you. I'd love okay. to. I'd love to move on to to save a little time for questions for yeah. you. Uh, Ju Julia, would you like to ask those or do you want me to read them from the chat? 
Yeah, go ahead, uh, Matthew. Uh, go go for it. And um, also, oh yeah, they were. I was wanted to say, stop the screens, uh, sir, so we can see each other. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, that was okay. fabulous, Eleanor. What beautiful, beautiful work. So um, uh, before we all leave, uh, there's also two other um, speakers uh, that are are here uh, watching Eleanor's presentation. So I want to point them out right at the end. So let's answer questions first. So go ahead. Um, sure. the, the first ones come from Carl Shubbs. He would like to know uh, why you prefer landscapes and what's your go-to lens? Um, why well, I prefer landscape format, right? I don't, so when I lived in New York, I used to shoot vertically. Uh, and I don't know why, but when I moved to Valparaiso, I started shooting horizontally. No idea why, it just kind of happened. Um, and I used to think of myself as a vertical shooter. I don't know, I just, uh, I do. And I think after a while you can, um, when you're working on a, on a body of work, then you have the idea of trying to be consistent. Um, and so you start shooting more in, in one way or the other, depending on the body of work. And the other one was my lens of choice, mm -hmm. uh, 35 or 27. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, let's see other questions. You've got lots of people co uh, complimenting your work, um, how beautiful it is. Um, yeah, there aren't too many. Julia, do you have any questions? Gosh, I, I, I always have so many questions about just where she's been and all her travels and, you know, I'm dying to ask her that later. But, um, uh, you know, I, I guess one of, the, one of the things that I wrote down that I, that I love that you uh, got into is the dark room. Because I think people who, who know about film and who have that experience, um, I, I think it's a real plus uh, uh, for, for people in, in, every, in a lot of ways. And so um, I, I think that darkroom work really enhanced, probably enhanced your black and white work um, uh, in, in, in a great way. It's really beautiful. I, I couldn't agree more. I, think I'm very, I feel very lucky that I got to start in the darkroom because um, I think that influences not, the, not just the way you see, but kind of the way you process too. Um, with Photoshop, you can go really crazy, but if you start from the dark room, I think your your approach is a bit more um, maybe maybe nuanced. You know, in in Lightroom, you you do more global corrections than local corrections in a way. Um, so so I'm really glad I got started in the dark room, um, and maybe I'll get back to it. But I don't know. It seems pretty unlikely. I like spending time out in the street now. So, but in a way, you know, with phenotypes, I worked my way my way back to. Uh, kind of a home lab situation. Do you have any um, other projects besides the, the street shooting you've been do, doing in your location uh, that you plan on a, a, attempting when you get out of lockdown? Are there any other new things you plan on trying or, or new places you want to explore? Um, I mean, the, the new things I've been doing have, all, have been in lockdown and I'm, I'm working on a new, uh, on a third, confinement project <laughs> now that I'm in lockdown again. Um, when I get back, I want to get to travel again. And I'd love to spend more time in Mexico um, and do street photography in Mexico. I got to go to Oaxaca a couple, three years ago now, and I really liked it. So I'd like, I would like to work um, in Mexico some more. And I adore Japan as well. So I'd love to go back to Japan and do, and do some work there. But, you know, I mean, street photography, I think is always gonna be kind of my base and, and something that I, that I love doing. So aside from when I can go out and shoot on the street and do street photography, I think I'll, I think I'll, I wanna go, I wanna get back to that. I wanna get back to street photography. Gotcha. And you talked about being part of a collective. Did I hear that correctly? Collective of other photographers? Um, yeah, Julia mentioned I'm part of a collective called uh, Up Photographers, and you have a few speakers that are from uh, our colleagues from my collective. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How did you guys get together? Sure. Um, I joined the collective about uh, a year ago, and it's an international collective of street photographers. And it's, um, I don't know, it's really nice. I, um, somebody asked, asked me, like, what is a collective like not that long ago? 
And the way I thought to describe it is uh, an invented family of sorts. So the very first people I go to with questions about what I'm doing or just photography in general, you know, we have a little chat and that's the first place I go for advice or just uh, discussions about photography. And that's really, really, really valuable to kind of find, find or, or make up a community, um, I think is really important. So, you know, whether that's a collective or um, local photo club, whatever it is, um, it really helps you grow to be able to talk about photography and um, share work in progress. And my colleague, Julia Byer, she helps me with editing a lot because we you know we're not good editors of our own work. So it's, that's a good place to do that too. Gotcha. And you talked about putting your work into different collections and different themes. Do you plan on, that made me think of a book. Do you plan on um, taking, making a book out of your work at any point? Yeah, I'd love to make a Valparaiso book for sure. Um, so, and, and I'm working on an exhibition for it as well. Um, but I don't know if it's, uh, if I'm ready to get for a book. So I keep, you know, I print, I print them and I, I put them somewhere and I, I move them around and I'm definitely starting to think about it, but I, I'm not sure when it will happen. Um, I do want to get into kind of small artist book though. Uh, especially for the cyanotype work and that I think I can do anytime because there's like it's a smaller format. Gotcha. Well we only have a few more minutes so if anyone out there has a question you can unmute yourself and ask your question or you can type it in the chat either one. Uh, we have a question how important are street photography competitions to your growth and development? Hmm. Um, so I've had the opportunity to judge, um, a few street photography competitions and I really enjoy the process. Um, I think with photography, it's, it's a very solitary activity, especially street photography. So I think any opportunity we can find to try and do something that feels a little more meaningful is important. And so street photography competitions, I think can be that way. Um, if you're submitting your work, um, I think it's a good idea to try and do the edit with somebody else. So then you can talk about your work and kind of maybe defend your work <laughs> if you need to, but that's an opportunity to, for you to start thinking about who you are as a photographer. And I think if you submit to competitions with that in mind and not you know just the reward um, then I think are super valuable. Any opportunity to, to talk, to think, to write about photography, you should jump on it. And, um, and as a judge, I feel exactly the same way. If, if I'm judging a competition, I take a lot of notes because for me, like seeing, seeing that getting a pulse for what, whatever is, is happening in street photography, that's really important. And so I, I read down little reflections, but it makes me think about my, my own work and what people like doing in photography. And yeah, I think, I think competitions are a great way for growth. I don't think they're the only one, but I think they're a good opportunity for growth. If you, if you, do, if you do ever think seriously, you know, I think you need to commit to whatever it is you're doing, even if it's a competition. Gotcha. Anyone have one last question before we wrap up? No other questions. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for your beautiful work. Oh, it's fabulous, Eleanor. Thank you so Thank much. You so much for joining. Yay, yay. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And uh, the next speaker is uh, David Gibson uh, at 1130. <laughs>